Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for hitting that play button for another episode of the Hetty Coleman Podcast, where I sit down with fabulous people to have go in conversations. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what go in means. Go in is being consistent in doing the right things that allow for you to achieve the wins that you have defined for your life so that you can live out your greatest story. It's all about your story, people. It's all about your story. So when I sit down with these fabulous people, the hope is that you can discover your goal. What is the goal? The goal are the right things that you need to be consistent in. Take those things, try them out for 90 days. If it don't work, try out a different right thing. You know what I'm saying? I just want to see you living out your greatest story. It's all about our stories. Today, ladies and gentlemen, today, it's not very often you have two big hitters in the room. You know what I'm saying? But today I pulled out some favors. I was like, please just show me some love. And I pulled out the one and only Taylor Doe. Taylor Doe, ladies and gentlemen, is in the building. Stop. You see him. If you watch it online, you see him right there. And then the one and only. See, they starting to know him by the OSU hype man. But what I know him by is a man who served our country, mm. retired, mm. lived overseas, mm. is the hype man for Jesus. Mm. Come on, now a TEDx speaker, just like Taylor Doe's a TEDx speaker, Les Thomas yes, Sr. Sir. Man, thanks for having us, man, for real. It's an honor yes. to be with both of y'all. Yeah, man. Hey, just real quick, why the senior now? You changed your uh, Instagram and you put senior SR yeah. on the end. It's because my son, you know, he's become a man now and he moved back here from college. And so just to make sure that there's a difference where people know it's him or myself, uh, I just decided to put senior on everything uh, just so people know the difference. I mean, even, I ran through some issues with my dad when I was his age with my credit because me and my dad got the same First name, but different middle names. Oh, gotcha. But some of his stuff was on my credit. And I was like, let me go ahead and start putting senior on everything to make sure that he doesn't deal with the same thing, even though my credit is good. You know what I'm saying? My credit is good. <laughs> he wants my credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He wants my yeah, credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants my name on his stuff. Yeah. Well, in identity, too. Like, I, I um, sometimes, and I don't know if my son deals with this or not, but sometimes people with that's named after their father or someone, they may kind of deal with the identity thing. And so, that kind of gives him his own name. He's yeah. the second, and I'm senior. Bro, I don't see your son having an identity crisis. Yeah, yeah, I don't like see he, it either. He's doing his thing, yeah, right? Yeah, he's, he's doing great. Yeah, he's man, great. he's a super talented young man, smart, yeah. intelligent. But, yeah, I, I definitely get that. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to invite both of y'all down to Guthrie America, sit down with me on the podcast to talk about the experience y'all just had being TEDx speakers, uh, TEDx OKC speakers. And uh, one, I was in Tulsa at the time doing a retreat. Some people come to the retreat and they were talking about it. People texting me talking about it. And specifically, the two of you come up. Now, that may, and I was friends with several of the people there, but they both talked about your talks. And I was like, man, I want to get them on the podcast just real quick and just talk about your experiences. And then also I feel like your topics were something that you want to carry on. You don't want it to just stop there. And so I just want to talk about the topics. Let's talk about your experience and topics, but just tell a little bit about yourselves, and then we're going to that. Taylor, you want to go first? Yeah, let's go. Uh, so my name is Taylor Doe. Also go by Tito uh, is my nickname. And, yeah, this is my first time doing a TEDx talk. Uh, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, I am from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, but it went to OU and now I'm on the east side of Oklahoma City, worked in schools for several years. Uh, I love community and so I want to be around families and students. And so I moved to the east side about a decade ago just to be closer and be in the mix. Uh, and so a lot of what I talked about uh, for TEDx stemmed from experiences that I had uh, being on the east side and even some of my upbringing and things like that we can get into. But um, that's a little about me. It's good. Man, Les Thomas, um, you know, I almost said East Side Drummer, but that's Cadence, man. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you stealing identities now. We're talking about credit, identity, you man. credit. Now you're stealing identity. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, shoot, man. Um, man, hype man, OSU. As you can see, Tito is sitting uh, south. I'm sitting north because he represents the school down south. I represent the school north. So yes, sir. that was planned, you know. But um yeah man uh hype man for OSU retired military 
Uh, married for 22 years to my amazing family, my greatest accomplishment by far of anything I've ever accomplished. I'm a new author, man. Yes, you know sir. What I'm saying? Just released that book, you know, and I'm um, excited about everything. My uh, talk stemmed from what I just said is my greatest accomplishment, and that's my family. Um, uh, pretty much from the childhood trauma, you know, um, I, it created something within me where I neglected my family, um, as when I got married and when they were young. And so it was a moment where I decided to show up, man. So I, um, my talk was just basically on, you know, who's suffering because you haven't showed up. Who's waiting mm-hmm. for you to show up? What was your community, your family life, your neighborhood, um, your, your work, your place of, of employment be like if you decided to show up? You know, that kind of sums it up. But that's where it stemmed from. It stemmed from a dude that is like beyond grateful for the relationship he has with his family and understands that sharing those wounds with people um, can help free other people. And yeah. so I say it often. You know, I don't really worry about impressing those that we think matter. I care about giving people hope. And That's so good. if it means me opening myself up and putting my life on the table um, to produce hope, man, I'll do it. That's good. That's good. T- before before we go any further, one, I want to come back to showing up. So I, I I think what I hear you saying is like you can be present, but you haven't shown up. All right. mm. you're, you're in the room, but you're not showing up. That's right. It. And I also feel like some of your talk deal with kind of the – Giving the key or showing up or, you know, like kind of move forward. Before we get into this, though, how do you – so somebody's probably wondering, like, how do you become a TEDx speaker? What what was that process like? What did that look like for you all? I mean, I can speak to that because it kind of aligns with my talk. Uh, it's through relationships. So we uh, got invited to do these talks, the the – organizers knew of our concepts before we'd shared those before. So this was not kind of the, f- the first time. And so they kind of handpicked people that they thought would, would go well with the theme of the, the Ted experience in Oklahoma city. And so uh, I don't know how many months ago it was that the ask was made. Uh, and then we started working on our talks, kind of crafting our talks, but uh, yeah, it was definitely through relationships. Um, they'd seen kind of the way that we chose to live our lives and the things that we do, and it came, it came from that. Yeah, just to echo, um, I don't know how many speakers around the country, once they found out I was speaking, messaged me and said, man, how did you do that? Because for a lot of, you know, Tito, Tito and I was blessed to for opportunity to come our way that a lot of people seek to do, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, most TEDx's that say you can, you know, submit, you know, even here in Oklahoma City, you can submit. Uh, to try to be on the next one, but we were blessed to be in a position. Um, but that comes from relationships and that comes from doing work, um, that's visible in the community where mm. people say these guys and everyone else that's on that stage, right? Um, has something that Oklahoma City needs to hear. Gotcha. That's so good. Um, so relationships, let's talk about showing up in a sense of like, you can be there in the room, but that doesn't mean that you're showing up. Is that is that is that where you're coming from on that? Yeah, that, that's spot on. Um, basically, I said I was living at home, but I wasn't living in the home. Mm. And so I was there and I wasn't present. So in my case, um, when I realized November 2007 that uh, I was at home, but I wasn't in the home is when my family was in the backseat playing Remember When. And I start at first it was cool. I was enjoying it, having a great time laughing. And next thing you know, and I'm getting smaller and smaller in my seat. And I realized, man, dang, these stories don't include me. So like here it is. And not only did they not include me, but I, don't, I had never heard them before. So I'm like, I've been at home and this been happening under my nose, you know, and I knew nothing about it. And so I realized then I started just to go even further. I started thinking about all the times that my son asked me to play basketball. And I would say, Daddy was tired. You know, all the times my daughter asked me if she could make music with me or whatever. And I would say, Daddy tired. And I would say, Tomorrow I'm tired. And so I went on to say that I had created this world called Tomorrowland where everything is great. Everything is beautiful. Everything is amazing. But in that moment, I realized that Tomorrowland was fake. And so that's when I decided to be present, to show up and show out in my family, show out what I wanted to. You can't just show up. That's half the battle, right? Mm-hmm. You have to put in the work. So I decided to show up, show out, put in the work. And it has it completely that one moment completely changed the trajectory of my family. And so if people know less time, it's one thing they know is hope 
right? And the other thing they know is, man, that dude loves his family. And that's that came from that one decision of deciding to show up. Mm. Let me ask you this. So you decide to show up. Now that sounds easy. Like tomorrow I'm just gonna start showing up. Yeah. Was that the case or did it did it take you a little while? Did you get a mentor? Did you how 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 did you get into that spot of being Man, you, you sure you wasn't there doing the TED talk? Man? No, I was not there. I was not there. <laughs> no, I know you weren't there. <laughs> uh, we would have seen you smiling and greeting at the door if you right. was there. But um no, it, it it took some time and what I did exactly what you just said. I actually was intentional with getting some mentors because I can't I can't do something I don't know how to do. And that was one of the things I talked about at the beginning of the part with my family is it, I had to play a role that I wasn't built for. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a blueprint on how to be a husband, how to be a father. So when I decided to show up, I surrounded myself because we're the sum of the people around us, right? So I surrounded myself. I was intentional with mentors saying, like, how do I be a husband? How do I be a father? And I just started sit, sitting at the feet of husbands and fathers and started learning from them. And, you know, it's not like I, uh, you know, changed overnight. It took some times. I still failed many, t- many times after that. The different was, the difference was I knew I had a problem mm. and I recognized there was a problem because you can't fix something you don't know if you don't know if it's a problem. Gotcha. So the difference was I was then conscious of I had a problem and then I did, I did what I had to do to get better, which it, it took some time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's good. That's good. Now, what was the title of your talk? I really, my title changed 50 times. It went from, you know, it's never too late to be a husband and a father to basically just kind of show up, man. I mean, like, honestly, I didn't really have a title, man. You okay. Know, I mean, I mean, it was also about what, what was, you know, I was just saying we weren't asked for a title. Yeah. So I think that's something that comes post before they post online. That's when the title process will happen. Gotcha. So it, it didn't start with a title. There we go. It, they didn't introduce us with a title of, of the talk. It was mainly just introducing us as people. And then we came out and gave the talk. Yeah. Uh-huh. There we go. Um, so even, even run of show or anything, there were like no titles associated with the talk. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. See, I, I didn't know that. Didn't know that. Tito, let's talk about, the keys, the key, the keys. Come on, bring it Is home. Is it Tito. keys or key? Y'all get, I mean, y'all one get of the people cash actually up. that came to Tulsa had a key. Let's go. I yeah. just got a question. Is there a key in your pocket for me? Come on. Man. <laughs> Hey, I got my key. My, <laughs> hey, I, hey, everybody man, okay, watching. Wait, 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 we'll get to that. Okay, okay let's we'll get, get to that. that. Okay, okay, let's get that. Because that's get that. that's secondary. Okay, real quick. Let's go. So. Uh, you guys can get down with this because you guys mentor and work with young people and and have been uh, been around in the game for a while. But something when you mentor uh, young people is you talk about the future a lot mm-hmm. and you dream and you see the future in young people and you try to bring it out of what they're trying to do and all that. And so through an event that I would do every year called Fast Food Valentines, where we would uh, get dressed up in tuxedos, rent a limousine with some of my guys, we would pass out cards and chocolates and roses to ladies working at fast food restaurants on Valentine's Day. Um, we, like I said, we, you wear tuxedos and you just feel yourself when you're wearing a tuxedo, like the, the way you walk changes, like everything. And so we talk about business. We talk about making money, all that stuff. And so in the back of the limousine back in 2016 on Valentine's Day, one of my guys, Demarion, asked me a question. And he, he said, Tito, I want one of the good jobs when I get older. Like, how do I make the good money to, like, you know, just take care of my family, achieve my goals? He's like, how do people get the good jobs? And so that sent me on some research to, to do this. And what I found in my research as I was doing these interviews and recording them was um, kind of this theme that kept coming up. And there was a phrase that, that kind of disguised how opportunity works in America. And this phrase was, and then. So when we tell our stories, you know, I grew up in Bartlesville and then I went to the University of Oklahoma and then I worked at Sandridge Energy and then I started a tech company. Well, the advantages and the the resources and all the things are hidden behind that one phrase and then. Mm. And so I'd interview people and they say, as we kind of dug deeper, well, I went to school with Joe who knew Steven and that's how I got this job. Or, you know, my I was dating this guy and and his dad was a GM at this PR firm. And that was hidden behind this and then phrase that I kept coming across. Mm. And so I called them and then moments, uh, moments that we don't often tell. And I'm on a journey to help people unpack those and then moments. That's good. So 
I love that you said that, that behind the and then, because how did the and then even come about typically, For right? Sure. And so um, you get the job, but I don't tell you, but I do tell you, and then I moved to Guthrie, America, but I don't say how that transitioned. And so uh, in that, what – what do you think allowed for those people to be willing to, to give those people those and then moments? So I think there's a few things that play into that. I, what I say is and then moments are people, people who unlock resources, knowledge, and opportunity. So some of these are an and then moment can be someone who literally opens the door for you to get a new job. Uh-huh. Or an and then moment could be a person who introduced you to music for the first time. And you're like, I didn't even know this existed or investing. I didn't even know this world existed, right? Like that person is an and then. Um, and so in, in my story and in my, in my TEDx talk, I got to interview my grandpa before he passed away on his and then moments. And so I'll, for the podcast, I'll just kind of keep this short. He gets to a point where he says, and then I got a good job as I graduated high school to work at this gas pump factory. And it paid me enough to be able to go to college and not have to work during school and like just focus on my studies. So I asked him, I was like, how'd you get this job? Like, did you apply? You submit a resume. And he's like, no, the next door neighbor was the hiring manager. (laughs) Right. And he said, we actually didn't have enough money for me to have a car. So I'd actually ride to and from work with him. Mm -hmm. And so I did some research and I found the 1940 census and I found the name of my grandpa's next door neighbor, Ray Simmons. I'd never heard this man's name before in my life. I've heard my grandpa's story 1,100 times, right? Yeah. And so Ray Simmons was an and then moment for my grandpa, and my grandpa never said his name. Mm. And I don't even think he was – I know he wasn't intentionally leaving yeah. that out. It was just the way we tell our stories in America, Yeah. we leave out these details. Yeah. And so essentially what I kind of get to is people are keys that unlock opportunity. Um, and so I kind of showed the disparities. I did a little bit more research and found out that because of redlining, um, kind of exclusionary housing practices back in the day, no black and brown folks could live in my grandpa's neighborhood. And so then I'm like thinking back to Damarion, you know, the kid who asked me the question, I'm thinking about his great grandfather. It's like, man, if he lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana, no matter how hard he worked, that opportunity was locked for him because he couldn't even live next to Ray Simmons. Yeah. And so we're walking around with these different keys to unlock these doors. And so uh, just briefly to wrap up is like everyone faces these locked doors. You do less me. The person watching faces locked doors. It's not about the locked doors. It's about how many keys you have to unlock these doors. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned moving to the east side is that kids and people are born with different number of keys. Uh, And so I kind of get into that and invite people to share their story, but also unlock opportunities for others. So I had these keys made. <laughs> I was ready. For those of you I was ready. <laughs> for those of you listening on audio, Les is holding up a key. Yeah. I literally. put that key on my keychain that day. Now actually the day before because I had the privilege of sitting with yes. Tito in his living room and, and hearing his message. Yeah. yeah so I, I had five hundred keys made and one side of the key says and then moments as a reminder to like reflect on your story. And then on the other side, I don't know if you guys have rented a house before, but the key typically says, do not duplicate. Mm. And on this key, it says duplicate often. Often. Yep. And so being that. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Being that reminder to unlock opportunity for people outside your normal network uh, and all those things. Uh, Can I just say something too, man? It's like, um, you know, for Tito, man, I mean, I was there. I got to witness it in person and the impact. His talk, the impact that it had and that it's having on our city is tremendous, man. And like, you know, some talks are motivational. Some talks are speeches. Some talks are informative. For me, Tito's uh, message will echo throughout our city for decades, man, Mm -hmm. because it's people that's in there that went back and told their circle about so so tito hit more than however many people was there because i guarantee you like when you go to an all-day talk um you're not everything's gonna stick with you it's impossible oh you yeah. know you might have a sharp mind you know where you can remember a few things from everyone but those highlight moments is what you're going to share with people and i'm willing to guarantee you that for most of the people there 
Even the people that wasn't there to see Tito, they were there to see their best friend, whoever that is, whether it's me, Corey, or Mike Hearn, or whoever. Whoever came to see us, when they left, they talked about this guy, bro. <laughs> I, I, it was that good. I mean, like, you know, he didn't pay me. No, he did not cash out me for me to say what I just said. His talk was that good. Man. Yeah. Yeah. You So listening to the uh, – listening to – um, Tito, I'm thinking about your, your talk and you talking about, uh, being a father and, and finally showing up. And to me, like really what Tito is encouraging people to do is to show up in people's lives. Yeah. And yeah. so whenever you, you start showing up in your kids' lives that way, and then they have some of their end then moments, oftentimes we talk about our mom, or our dad. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And you could have missed that moment of being that that key to your own kids. Like right in our yeah. own homes, yep. we get to be keys. And sometimes we miss these opportunities. Talk about like That's good. what that has looked like for you and how do we encourage some other people? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, no, I can share, I can share that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think Henny might know, but I don't, I think, but this um, is an, and then moment. This is a, this is prime example. Yeah. Of what this is, about. this is, yes, yeah, true. So my son, long story. This didn't make short. TEDx, ladies and gentlemen. This yeah, wasn't it make TEDx. Make okay, TEDx. See. <laughs> but, but <laughs> my son, uh, graduated from, um, Franklin and Marshall, uh, May of last year. He worked at CVS in, in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, came home, transferred to CVS. And the first week that he returned, from CVS, um, he was working at the store. And, you know, the laws are different in different states. Well, here, you can't sell alcohol if you don't have a license. Even even if you walk into 7-Eleven, the person that's at the at the cash register has to have a liquor license. Oh. That's something new in Oklahoma. Okay. Well, my son didn't know that. CVS didn't let him know that. And he sold alcohol to a person that was, that was over age. They were the right age, but he didn't have his license. And so... They um, it was an undercover. Boom, she hit him, you know, and she could tell that he didn't know what was going on, right? And so um, he he's like panicking because he's about to start this job with the state, and you know, and if he's and she said to him, "I'm sorry, your store failed you. I can tell you didn't know what was going on, but I still have to write you this ticket, right?" So here it is, a kid that just got his bachelor's is about to start his master's program and about to start working for the state that if he's if he's found guilty, which he's guilty, right? And if you're going by the law, even though he didn't know, that's not their fault, right? He will then, he would have got a misdemeanor. So every box you check when you go fill out an application, yeah. Yeah. it's not separate. Misdemeanor and felony is the same box. Yeah. That would have changed the tra- trajectory of his life. Yeah. But he, and then he called me afterwards, right? And then I called someone after he called me, right? And then they called to the powers that be, and then it changed, yeah. right? And he, that from those and then moments of like when my son tells his story, you know, that's what Tito was talking about. Like my son shouldn't say, you know, I got this ticket um, and I got out, I got out of it. And thankfully it didn't go on my record. No, there's those and then moments of, and then I called my dad and then my dad knew someone. And then that person knew someone, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And, and made a phone call that stopped. Just imagine the hurdle that would have put in my son's life mm-hmm. by something he didn't know. Mm. Right. Something that would have changed the trajectory of his life. Kid that just finished school, good kid. You just talked about him earlier. Yeah. But those and then moments of, you know, people relationships. He he said pretty much it's relationships. And thankfully, you know, there's unfortunately there's a lot of people that Tito and myself in the community that we serve, they don't have those connections. Mm. And that's what Tito was talking about. What about the people that don't have these connections? And he gently challenged and held us accountable to Consider that one when you judge other people from afar. Like, for instance, let's just bring it home. When you say, you know, you could pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, some people don't have bootstraps. Some mm-hmm. people don't have boots, but you do. So if you got an extra pair of shoestrings, how about you give them to someone? Mm. Like, that's what I got out of it. Like, it really held me accountable too. like, what else can I do to help people? And in that case with my son, you know, that's a that's a great example right there. And and to speak to that. That stuff happens in affluent communities all the time. 
And so that's where I was speaking from is I, I grew up in that environment where it's like, you know, the, you know, the DA, you know, it's like, you know, the, the doctor who lives down the street. So if there's something that happens, you just make a a phone call, a house Mm -hmm. call, you know, it's like all of these things that for a small percentage of America is just everyday life. Mm -hmm. And so part of my talk was just like, bring that awareness to like, I'm just letting you know how I grew up. In, in a place that I live right now, it's not that. Mm. Um, and so I tried to do that gently uh, in a way that was was palatable, um, in a way that challenged people to think about their story. Because I think when you think about your story, there's a level of humility that comes with that, that says, I didn't do this all on my own. <laughs> and with that realization, I think that's the posture that we need as a society to say, mm-hmm. because I didn't do it on my own, I want to help other people do mm-hmm. it. And so business leaders, church leaders, civic leaders, all of those, if you can be in that position to create and then moments for the people in your pews, for the people on your street, for your neighbors, for you know all those things, I think we live in a better society. I think the numbers and the disparities start to shrink when we start seeing people uh, in that different light. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that so much. You know, we do this thing called hashtag community wins in Guthrie. And um, essentially, that's what that is. Like, we win when we're willing to be the key for somebody or we can be that and then person for for somebody. Because when that happens, everybody wins. Because of that, somebody got a job. Now they can take care of their family. Now we may not all be millionaires or billionaires, but we're all in a su- sustainable position. For sure. And what we need to be aware of, and I, and I kind of touched on this a little bit, was we still live in a very segregated and siloed society. Right. We, our neighborhoods, you know, the, the way that we have schools set up, our cities, all of that. And so opportunity flows through those relationships. Yeah. And so that's what I've seen being on the east side is I see brilliant people. I just don't see the access or the connections to relationships. So I kind of got into, I didn't get into de- to, to a whole lot of data, but just said, man, there's some new studies that have come out that show the importance of connectedness between classes. And that really impacts upward mobility and people mm-hmm. being able to provide for their mm-hmm. family. And so, yes, one is to to give keys, but we already kind of naturally do that for people in our circles. The, the That next level challenge was let's give keys to his, people who have historically been left out mm-hmm. or people That's we good. don't often yeah. give keys to. Yeah. So that was really kind of the the one of the invitations that I, I gave to the audience. Can we talk about a, a how to on that? Like, I hear what you're saying. But what if there's somebody listening in and they'd be like, man, but what does that really look like? Can, for you, you moved into a community to where maybe there's not th- this thing that you're talking about. But now you're saying, man, how can I figure out how to be that person? Yeah. Not everybody may not move into those communities. Oh, sure. is, there, is there ways that you can? Yeah, I don't think people <laughs> should uh, yeah. per se. So there's some research and data that just came out on spaces and places that – actually are kind of the soil is more ripe for uh you would think that neighborhoods would be one and that's actually the least likely for friendships to to happen and mainly because we're just so segregated by class in neighborhoods uh the one place that has um it's called friending bias so are you more likely to be friends with somebody that's what they measure and religious institutions have the lowest friending bias so our churches, our synagogues, our places of worship are actually the best place for these cross-class connections to happen. That's what the data shows. That's mm-hmm. not just me looking. And so y- you you look at that. The other is kind of um, civic organizations, entertainment. So you start thinking of like sports. Uh, like a lot of I'll, – I'll just speak to white dudes real quick. A lot of white dudes um, – process this through basketball like there's just connection on the floor like i played with black you know black guys at aau and like i learned that they didn't grow up like me and so you see sports as a as a grounds where it's kind of a low stakes where not a lot is riding on it but you have these relationship building moments Mm -hmm. Uh, i call them trust building moments low stakes practice reps together that allow us to build trust and that's where church athletics entertainment what you guys do with um the red brick yeah, River Knight. Yes, exactly, bro. Like, that's all that goes through my head is like, who's sitting next to each other at Red Brick Nights? Yeah. And how do we 
if, if I'm a mayor of this city is like, man, how do I make people who s- don't normally sit next to each other, sit next to each other mm-hmm. for this. Yeah. And like the way that we build our spaces, all of that, that's a whole nother conversation. But like, how can we funnel people? How can we make people sit? How do we facilitate these conversations? Those are all things you guys are ripe for being in that environment for those, for those cross cultural and cross class relationships. That's good. One thing I would add to it as well is the people that sit in these positions of power to consider that whenever someone comes in front of them, that they they may not have the connections of the other person you just helped out Mm. because a relationship, because someone made a phone call text to you, you may be more, um, you may be more willing to help that person. Right. But what about the kid that, didn't know anyone that can make a phone call to you and they're standing in front of you. I even like if you're a judge or you're a boss or you're a manager hiring people um, that consider that. Like, so I believe it, it happens through community, but I think it also brings accountability to those that are in those positions to make decisions and not always go with the person that was able to get a phone call to get in your ear. What about that kid that worked hard, Bust they butt, did everything they had to do um, to even get an opportunity to stand in front of you to interview. Yeah. Yeah. Or or they're standing in front of you in a in a courtroom and you're a judge and this kid has never gotten in trouble before. I got a problem with if you let Johnny off and you don't let Tyrone off. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like think about that. When you're in a leadership position, you can't be partial. So of course it comes through one community with, you know, building community and, and making sure you're giving, you know, keys to other people. But when you have an opportunity of someone standing in front of you, don't hold it against them that they don't have a key mm-hmm. and consider their life. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. And w- when you do do that, that helps that kid at some point understand what it means to have somebody in your life that does have a key, you know, cause once you see it, then you're like, Oh, now I see how this works. Yep. And when you use it in the right way, then you inspire, encourage others to do the same. And hopefully they go tell that story. And and you have to be careful a little bit of this kind of savior complex, right? It's like I have all these keys and, and all that. I think what people will start to realize is how many keys and and benefit that other communities bring Yeah. once that relationship happens, right? It's like, oh, I'm doing this good favor or whatever. But then once you actually get into that relationship, like I can't tell you how many, you know, doors Damarion has unlocked for me or Mm -hmm. conversations that we've had, Mm -hmm. the value that he's brought to Mm -hmm. my life. You know, he's like, he lived with me the last 10 months while he was at Douglas High School before now he's at OU. And just the the value, the relationship that we have together. Yeah. It's like, if y'all think this is just me helping this kid, like, y'all totally wrong yeah um, no, that's good and so just to to know that that investment goes both ways yeah let's let's talk about the book yes and, sir uh, t- tell me how that book correlates with some of what your your tedx talk was about uh man the, the tedx uh, i'm a product of being mentored you know i had a, i had a praying mother that did everything that she could uh but the mentors filled the gap for me so for me to climb out from being a you know, a, a, a kid that had a, a small juvenile record, you know, to um, being that uh, husband and father, being in that role without fulfilling the role. Mentors is what helped me climb out of that. Um, and those examples, that's who gave me the blueprint. And so this book, uh, I've been wanting to give birth to it for 10 years, man. And it's called Three Levels of Influence. And it's all about your sum of your circle. And so the influences in your life is important. And it's like what goes in comes out, right? So if I surround myself around successful people, I have a better chance to be successful. If I surround myself around people that's negative, I have a better chance of being negative. And so this book right here, um, with me being a product of being mentored, um, I just wanted to give a blueprint and also some ideas and encourage people, one, to be a mentee. And two, to mentor. And I think a lot of times people run in the book. I made sure to convey it and and speak on it from a perspective of it's not as hard as you think, because I think some people run away from that um, title because they think they become responsible for the person. Mm -hmm. Not not one of my mentors became responsible for me. Mm -hmm. They just helped me 
you know, and um, it's up to me on the decision I make. So if my mentee go rob a bank, that is not my fault. I gave my tool, my mentee the tools that they need to be their most successful person in their life. And if they choose to make a decision that on something I don't agree with, it's not my fault. So I kind of relieve some of that. And so to paint a picture of what a mentor is in your life is like, imagine, imagine you, you know where you're headed, right? So imagine someone drop you off at a, at a airport and there's no signs, you know, you're flying Delta, but there's no signs of telling you where Delta is. And when you get there, there's no signs telling you what gate to go through. Once you get through the security, it's no signs telling you what terminal. So imagine flying and you're like, I know where I'm headed, but there's no signs and there's no help for me to get to where I'm at. In a sense, that's what a mentor is doing in your life. A mentor, they're not telling you where to go in life. They're not controlling your life. You know where you're headed. A mentor is that voice or that um that person in your life to help you get to your destiny mm. on where you're going. So they become the signs. They become the saying, like when you hit us somewhere, they become that wisdom or that voice that you can bounce things off of. And I can tell you right now, I 100% would not be the man that I am if I didn't have mentors. I know I got God. That's number one. I have an amazing wife that trusts me and loves me. That's number two. I had an amazing mom. That's number three. But I will tell you that for real, my mentors has played just as important role in my life as anyone else. And so I just like, you know, I'm like, man, let me let me give the blueprint of a lot of my success that I've had because I pay homage to my mentors just as much as I do anyone else in my life. And so, yeah, man, three levels of influence. It's your it's your mentor. And then the second level is that iron sharpens iron level, you know, um, and then the, the third level is having a mentee, you know, so. That's good. How long did it take you to write the book? What was the process like? Nah, man. Um, now, I, heard, I know you said you've been 10 years, but you ain't I, been well, working actually, on it 10 I years. I started on it December 2019. Okay. And shout out to my dude, Marcus Black. Uh, we started a week apart of each other. He dropped his three months later. <laughs> I'm dropping mine. Let's see what this will be about. Three 20, years later? Yeah, <laughs> about 32 <laughs> months later. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, for real. And so, um, and for me, it's like, you know, several things is going on. And, um, you know, I had some help with, you know, I, I completely write, the, I wrote the book. So don't I, shout out to, I, I know Ghost Riders over here. I wrote the book. Um, but I did have some amazing editors, um, that helped me. And, um, I just, I needed help getting it out, you know, because naturally a lot of people think because I write music that it's easy to write a book. That's two different lines. That's yeah. two different lanes there. So yeah, man. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a challenge. Um, uh, it took me two and a half years, but here we go. Yeah. When, when can people get the book? Is it out or what does so that the book like? is available, uh, starting September 20th. You can go to less Thomas senior.com, less Thomas senior.com. Um, when you go to that website, I have a, a tab that says book. Boom. You can actually pre-order it right now. I don't know when this is going to release, but you can actually pre-order it right now. If it's after the 20th, just go to com and you'll be able to go there and get the book. Or you can go to Amazon or whatever. So you can get the ebook or you can get the hard copy. And I got copies too. So if somebody said they want it to be signed, either you can purchase it and I'll meet, meet up with you somewhere or you can uh, hit me up for one and I can I can do that too. That's legit. Yeah. Tito, talk to us about what's next. You done, done the talk. You got <laughs> you got it out there. Like, what does it look like for you next? Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit before I go forward. Yeah, no, no. Take your time. So when I first got to OKC and kind of the east side, I read this book that impacted me. And in the it's kind of a community building book. And in the preface of the book, which I don't typically read, uh, it uh, talked about the author and it said this author ministered and served in obscurity for a decade before anyone knew his name mm. or before he spoke. And I underlined that and I was like, I want to be that dude. And so May of 2021 marked a decade of doing work, not posting on social media other than fast food, Valentine's day, just getting to know families, going to basketball games, funerals, birthday parties, everything. And so this TEDx Oklahoma City talk was really like this is the first time I felt like an actual like release to be able to talk about mm. the way that 
community has impacted me, yeah. um, the way that I've served, the relationships, some concepts that I've been wrestling with for a long time as I think about poverty and people moving up and social mobility and kind of these topics that I'm really passionate about. Ted X Oklahoma City was that like, here is Tito, right? Like you sort of knew what I did, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you didn't know who I was at all, which is probably more likely. This was the talk was like, here's what I'm passionate about. Here's what I want to talk about for the next decade. Here's some concepts. And I have more concepts that I want to introduce to you, but here's kind of the main overarching one. Yeah. And so that's what I think the future is for me is like one stay continue to stay connected with families and kids and two, like help people unpack poverty, opportunity in America, social mobility. Some of these concepts that uh, I hear people talk about a lot and they're, it's complex and I'll really want to make it, uh, understandable in a way that we can actually start changing those statistics. That's good, man. It was like his coming out, man, bro. Like he, he been doing work on the East side yeah. for a decade, like he just said. And so like, I mean, it's, it, it was a, an amazing opportunity. I think it's it just, I think it was an open door by, from God, um, to see, uh, where people got to peek into Tito's life and what he's been doing. And like he said, you know, he brought up the savior, complex or the savior thing earlier you know people ask me all the time what can we do and i was like the best thing you could do is come in join a community or partner with people versus coming in saying i'm we need to do it this way and you try to come in and run mm. it and take over totally. i've never seen that from tito tito was like how can i serve yeah there's a big difference so yeah no that's good you know now talking about relationships i always like to to, to point out that um i always tell people i hadn't filled out an application in a long time Derek made me fill out an application yesterday, but uh, part of the reason that I, that I feel like I've been able to do anything is because we tell stories, you know, and we tell stories is all about building relationships and connecting with people. And, and, and out of that, not saying that it, that needed to happen in order for me to do the next thing, but it just kind of happens when you start building relationships and listening in on people's stories. And then once you listen to that story, you can be like, oh, I can help you do this or that and that and connect you with people. And so, I mean, from just sitting right here, Les and I know each other because of we tell stories. I know you because of you, because of Derek, mm -hmm. because of we tell, so, you know, yeah. you know, and so uh, what both of you all are saying is in that there had to be this showing up, be willing to come to the event. Then once you got to the event, you had to be willing to connect with people. And then I feel like just kind of naturally, we started all handing keys to each other. You know, Absolutely. and and it and it's just really cool to be able to sit here and listen in on this. And I think for me, that's when I was listening, I was like, man, it's been years of just grinding to keep showing up, you know, for a lot of us. For and so what you said to that kind of triggered a, a thought and, I, and kind of shows up in the, the TEDx talk was in America, we kind of have this mentality of kind of this zero sum game when it comes to opportunity, like if I give out a key, I'm down one key and I could give out too many keys and beat a zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's actually the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Opportunity in America is compounding. Yeah. Just like your story. We we tell stories, then this goes to this, then this goes to this. So when you step into new rooms, we're actually getting more keys every time we do that. Mm -hmm. And so I can feel more comfortable and safe to keep giving out keys because I step into new rooms and I get more keys. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. You stepped into a room with We Tell Stories and you were vulnerable and you invited people into that space. And and then, and yeah. then, and then, <laughs> and then, right? Yeah. You can go back to that moment and say, man, look how many of these things spurred from this. Yeah. Uh, and that's happened in my life so many different times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I th go ahead. No, I was gonna say it's a lot of end then moments that can go all the way back to we tell stories. I mean, like I, a lot of people, a lot of end then moments have started from that. So, all yeah, the relationships. It's all about those relationships, and a lot of those people out of that. There's mentor, like mentoring is gonna be a big piece of what they talk about. You know, everybody. Absolutely. When I think about these people that I'm thinking about right now, it's like they would all have this mentoring piece to them. So I, I want to say this, and and Hedy's heard this before, but. You know, if someone's watching, maybe you've never heard this or seen uh, me talk about it. But and how Hetty and I got connected was we tell stories, and I I was deployed uh, doing Operation Iraqi Freedom. I was deployed to Kuwait, and I only knew I didn't know Hetty very well at all. And while I was overseas, Hetty wrote me letters, 
Like here it is, a guy that I barely knew took out time to handwrite a letter. Now you gotta understand, when you overseas, it's almost like being in jail. <laughs> anything that you get excites you in the in the mail. You know, you get a, a care package, anything. So I was so excited when I'm like this guy who I had never even sat down to eat dinner with or lunch or anything or coffee. Uh, is taking out time to write me. That says a lot about Hedy's character and his heart, and that's one reason why you've seen so much, uh, so much uh, like it, uh, people that's connected to you flourishing because what's inside of you naturally is going to go on everyone else mm. and everywhere you put your hand and everyone that you connected with. That's one reason why mentorship is a big thing. That's one, one reason why love is a big thing and smile. I mean, do you get excited about greeting people? Bro? Yeah, I don't know a lot of people who get excited about greeting people. That's that's rare. That is rare. <laughs> yeah, man, no, but I think it's all for me. It's just all about those relationships. Like the easy way to be able to connect with people, be at the front door, you know, and open Absolutely. the door and serving people in that way. And so, it's an easy thing, and most people invite you to come and greet, like. I've got the opportunity to be a lot of places I probably wouldn't get to just because they wanted me to come open the yep. door, and I'm game to do that. And and another point to that is I'm not downplaying hard work or creativity Mm-mm. or any of these things. So that that's one thing that kept coming up in these interviews and this research I was doing was there was kind of this clause that everyone used while they were saying was like, I worked hard to get this. You know, I I went through the struggle, and then I worked hard. Uh, and so that was a common theme as well that showed up in these interviews. And so I'm not coming after that. Like it requires hard work to be successful in America. Mm -hmm. It requires hard work to show up early for uh, an event and Mm -hmm. stand out in the heat in front of the, in open heavy doors for people and, you know, make, make all those things. So I'm saying, yes, it does take hard work. I want to talk about the other part of the equation that we've left out for a very long time or that we hide or have has been hidden when we tell our stories. Yeah. And that's what And Then Moments is. Yeah. So good. Tell people where they can find you on social media. I'm just T-Doe, T-D-O-E on Instagram uh, and other platforms, Taylor Doe. Man, you can go to lesthomassenior.com or on Instagram is lesthomas.senior. Um, and on Twitter, it's uh, less. Oh, yeah, let's go pokes too. So, without the T, L E S G O P O K E S. If you want to connect on the OSU stuff, that's on Instagram and Twitter. So, yeah, and I have all that tagged and also in the descriptions for the most part. And, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for hitting that play button for another episode of the Hedy Coleman podcast. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, as always, go win. Yep. <laughs>